me family welcome all the people on the websites all over the world and welcome to all the people watching the video we thank god for you we thank god for you this is a wonderful day this is a day that the lord has made i'm pastor leroy carter back to basics ministries incorporated located in lithonia georgia here in the good old usa thank god for his goodness and his mercy it's daylight saving time today today's the first day on daylight savings time for those of you in foreign countries who are not familiar with this in america we uh, set our clocks ahead one hour at midnight at a certain time of the year this is the time of the year so that we can have an extra hour of daylight and uh, i look in my chat window and i see a lot of people did not set their clocks forward they're going to come on maybe an hour late so they're going to have to watch the video but praise god for the video we're recording so we ask that you mute your phones and uh, we praise god i've got a great message for you today i'm excited about what god has given me for you and we want to welcome you again to the back to basics online church you know the online church is reaching a lot of people 80 percent of americans do not attend church consequently a larger percentage in European nations do not attend church. The greatest uh, demographic where the church is growing in the world today is in Africa. And I commend my brothers and sisters in Africa for continuing to preach the gospel and for standing on the wall for Jesus. And I commend all my friends in Europe and in the United States who are diligently doing what God has called you to do. We're living in an age of apostasy. That's a word that means falling off. People have, many people have decided to turn God off and try to work things out their own way. Ladies and gentlemen, that is a futile course. It's a dangerous course. You cannot work your way through this world without the creator of the world guiding you and directing you. Okay, so things may not be going your way, but don't reject God. The worst thing you can do is to deny God. The scripture says, any man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is not fit for the kingdom. So if you have uh, proclaimed Jesus and, and you, you started off with Jesus and you decided you're going to go a different way, there's no hope in it for you. There's no future. It will only lead to death and destruction. You may say, but pastor, I'm saved. I got baptized. I've been in church all my life. Ladies and gentlemen, I will not contend with you. I preach the gospel. The word of God says any man. That means any person. That means me if I turn back. Any man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is not fit. For the kingdom well you say what's that got what's 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 a plow well see a plow is something that you youngsters don't know anything about back in the old days before there were tractors and before there were big trucks and combines and all that people work their gardens by breaking up the ground they had a, a plow it was an, uh, a mechanic an instrument a tool that had a big old uh, like scoop on the front of it, and you push that plow or you had a mule pull you and you guided that plow to make a straight path. And if you turn to the right or to the left while plowing, you could notice it in the contour of your mark through the field. You'll have a crooked path. And so God says, any man having put his hand to the plow and looking back, if you look back, you're going to go to the right or to the left. You're going to go on the wrong path. So, ladies and gentlemen, we preach Christ Jesus. No, we do not honor Buddha. We do not honor Islam. We do not honor Muhammad. We do not 
honor Shinto. We do not preach anybody but Christ Jesus, because there is no name under heaven whereby we can be saved. You may say, well, it's, it's popular uh, to be a Muslim. Especially, and and here's, here's, a, here's a thing they say around here. If you go to jail, you better become a Muslim. That way you maintain your manhood and your integrity. Yeah, but you're going to go to hell for turning against God. First of all, you shouldn't even go to jail. You must be, you should be a law abiding and, uh, and stay out of prison. And if you do go to prison, you need to take Jesus Christ there with you, like Joseph did when he was in prison. You should draw an eye to God. If you're a prisoner listening in today, I beg you, draw an eye to Jesus Christ. Renounce those false religions. Well, they'll attack me and this, that, beat me. Well, you just have to take the beating. Shouldn't have done the crime. Shouldn't have done the crime. And and and, and that's, that's part of the consequence of doing the crime. When you break the law, you have to pay the price. But I want to say to you, all of you, if you're tempted to sin or tempted to commit a crime, you need to call on Jesus and ask the Lord to prevent you, help you not to do any crime. Because if you go to jail, you're going to go into a mess. And a lot of guys are in such a mess. I mean, their lives are so confused. But I say to you, Jesus will visit you in the prison. We see in scriptures in the book of Genesis how God visited Joseph and gave Joseph favor even in prison. Joseph was falsely accused. God's in the prison. God delivered Paul and Silas when they were thrown in jail for preaching the gospel. You can be thrown in jail in some countries for preaching the gospel. And they beat Paul and Silas and uh, put chains around them. And, and, and but, but God came into the prison because God was there. Ladies and gentlemen, when you put your trust in Jesus, no matter how adverse the situation may be, no matter how difficult your life may be, when you put your trust in Jesus Christ, God will be there. Don't turn. Don't turn to anyone or anything. Stick with the Lord Jesus Christ. No matter how difficult things may be, no matter how black the storm clouds may be, you stick with Jesus. Let us pray. Father God, we come in the name of Jesus, the mighty name of Jesus, our Savior, our Lord, our God and King. There's no other name under heaven whereby we can be saved. And so we ask that you guide us this day, guide us this day, guide your people today. Lord, reveal yourself to your people, visit your people, pour out your spirit upon them. Lord, if there's anyone listening in today who's not saved, help them to put their trust in Jesus Christ and ask God to save them through Jesus Christ. And Lord, we thank you for what you're going to do in their lives. We need you, Lord. We cannot make it without you, whether we're in America or England, whether we're in China or North Korea, whether we're in Israel or in Kenya. We need Jesus Christ. And so help us, Lord, and we praise you. Uh, let your anointing be upon your servant as I preach your word today. Help your people to hear. And Father, we ask that you save, heal, and deliver today. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Praise God. Well, bless God. For the next two weeks, I'm going to be preaching on a subject that will change your life, ladies and gentlemen. As you listen in, and those of you who are listening to the video, be sure to listen to next week's video. Also, this message will change your life wherever you are, whoever you are. If you are really, really, truly seeking God and want to live right, want a right relationship with God, you need to hear this message. And next week's, next week's message I'm going to be preaching today on reasons why God does not hear your prayers. I want to minister today and next week on reasons why God does not hear your prayers. I'm going to be talking about three reasons today. And then on next week, we'll talk about three more. I'm going to give you six reasons. That is not the entire list. It is not the, exhaust, the exhaustive list, but I'm going to give you six reasons why God does not hear your prayers. And if you will listen to this, and if you will make the adjustments, 
you'll find improvements in your life. You'll find miracles happening in your life. You'll see God moving like never before, ladies and gentlemen. Now, earlier on, a few weeks ago, I began preaching on how to hear from God. And it's important that you go back and review those tapes on how to hear from God. Now I want to minister in an area where so many Christians are losing ground. So many, so many Christians are saying, God does not hear my prayers. God does not answer my prayers. And there are many, many of you who are frustrated. You've been a Christian for a long time and you still don't have answers to your prayers. Well, I want to give you some answers as the Holy Spirit has put them on my heart. <clears throat> and so you might want to take some notes, write this down, and um, we're going to try to be brief. But we want to give you three today and three on next Sunday so that you'll have a package, a six-point package of why God does not hear your prayers. And then we want you to make the adjustments in your life. If, if one of those points uh, affects you, you need to make the adjustments. God wants to hear your prayer. God wants to be your friend. God is not angry with you and upset with you. God loves you. He's a God of love. And God is wanting to speak to you. He wants to fellowship with you. With you. He wants to have a uh, communion with you. And uh, we praise God. We thank God. We want to give a shout out to Matt Borland and his son, Braden. We want to give a shout out to Andy Mack. We want to give a shout out to Ryan. We want to give a shout out to all of our listeners. We're going to give a shout out to Elijah and all of our friends in Kenya. We want to give a shout out to all of our friends in Europe. We praise God. Now, let me continue. There are six reasons I will give you in the next two weeks, three today and three next week, on why God does not answer your prayers. And so pay attention and make the adjustments. And I guarantee you, in the name of Jesus, if you will make the adjustments, God will show up. He's just knocking on your door, wanting to bless you, and, and you've got to do some things. And, and I, I want to appeal <clears throat> to you proud, puffed up Christians. Uh, some of you, uh, you tune in, but nobody can teach you anything. I want you to humble yourself and make the adjustment. I have to humble myself and make adjustments. Well, I don't just preach something and, 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 and think I'm better than you. I've got to do what God says do. I want God to hear my prayer. I don't want to be lost. I don't want to be deceived. Ladies and gentlemen, there are people all over this nation and the nations who are deceived. They think that because they have given their lives to Jesus Christ, they can live any way they want, do anything they want, think anything they want, say anything they want, and they're going to go to heaven. No, no, all contraire. Uh, 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 that's French, to the contrary. God is a holy God, and he says we are to be a holy people. We are to live in holiness, righteousness. The scripture says holiness without which no man can see God. And so um, we want to encourage you to make those corrections in your life. I've got to make corrections in my life. Pay heed to God because these are the last days. Jesus is coming back again soon. And ladies and gentlemen, the scripture says thou art inexcusable, O man. So there be no excuses. When you stand before God, and I stand before God, there will be no excuses, ladies and gentlemen. The Lord is not going to accept any excuse, no matter who you are or what your excuse is. If you have not done what God has said, do. He's going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. Ladies and gentlemen, we're trying to prevent you from spending eternity in hell. Hell is not the place for you or me to go. God did not make that place for us. He made it for the devil and the demons who rebelled uh, uh, from God in heaven. But God has to judge sin. He's got to judge sin. And he's going to judge a lot of Christians who have rebelled against God and are doing their own thing. 
He's going to judge a lot of people who are walking their own walk and have denied God, who have turned their backs on God. And so I say to you, I appeal to you in the name of Jesus, repent, 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 repent while there is time. Well, pastor, what does repent mean? Repent means tell God you're sorry and don't just tell God you're sorry. Turn from it. Turn away. Walk away from it. If you're living in a homosexual relationship, you can cry to God all night long. You can cry to God all night long. But until you turn from it, your crying is just shedding tears and raising your blood pressure. If Unless you turn. I'm not judging you, but I'm preaching the gospel. Unless you turn from your sin, there's no salvation. You can be the pope. You can be the preacher. You can be the bishop. I know a lot of bishops who are, who are, who are gay, but, but, and, and, and they think they're deceiving the people. No, you can't deceive the people. You can't deceive God. You've got to meet with God, bishop. You've got to give an account for sleeping with another man. You've got to give an account, woman, for sleeping with another woman. So so don't get mad at me. I'm just a mailman. I'm the postman. Don't throw rocks at the postman. You better listen to this and get saved. You need to repent. Repent means confess it to God. Acknowledge your sin. Acknowledge it. Confess it. Ask God to forgive you. And then you've got to get out of it. You've got to say no. You've got to walk a new walk. You've got to walk holy with Jesus. You've got to say no. You've got to stop sleeping with men. You've got to stop sleeping with women. You've got to stop sleeping with somebody else's husband or somebody else's wife. You've got to stop molesting little children. Ladies and gentlemen, there are people all over this nation, all over this world who are crying because they're, they're living in sin and they want that bad boy off their back. They want relief. They they take they take a spiritual alka-seltzer. They they think that confessing their sins is going to get them set free. They do this plop plop fizz fizz. Oh, what a relief it is! Then they go back into molesting children, go back into lying, go back into stealing, go back into men sleeping with men, women sleeping with women. And there, ladies and gentlemen, that's just an act, a motion you're going through. It's deception. You must be delivered. The scripture says in Romans 6, 1 and 2, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? The Bible says, God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin continue any longer in it? God's going to judge, ladies and gentlemen. You can fool some of the people some of the time, but you can't fool God. And so I say, repent, acknowledge it, confess it, get up out of it, get up out of it, get up out of it, get out of that adulterous relationship, get out of the casino, get out of the, the corrupt places, get out of that bar, uh, get out of that alcoholism, get out of those things that are, be, uh, are destroying you. Don't just confess them. Don't just cry all night, but get up. We're going to look at a man in our sermon today who cried all night long, <clears throat> but God told him, get up. Well, let's look at, let's look at this. The devil's final strategy in deceiving believers is to make them doubt the faithfulness of God in answering prayer. Satan would have us believe God has shut his ears to our cry and left us to work things out for ourselves. I believe that the greatest tra tragedy in the church today is that so few now believe in the power and effectiveness of prayer. I'm going to repeat that. I believe that the greatest tragedy in the church today is that so few people now believe in the power and effectiveness of prayer. Ladies and gentlemen, I talked to a bishop. He's the bishop of a large in a large denomination. And uh, I pulled his coat. He's still mad at me today, angry with me, because I said, Bishop, you got all these churches under you, and you don't teach them about prayer. You don't have prayer in your agenda. You got all these pastors under you. They don't teach their people how to pray. What kind of denomination is it? He's still angry with me today. I pray that he'll repent 
and go and do what God, how can you be a bishop? How can you be a pastor and don't teach people how to pray? Ladies and gentlemen, how can you be a Christian and not pray? Ladies and gentlemen, Satan has deceived so many people and, and has caused them to believe that prayer is powerless. And you preachers out there have a responsibility. You've got to you do more than just uh, uh, win souls and bring them in and put an envelope in their hand and collect an offering from them and tell them and pat them on the back and have them go their own way. People are leaving church every Sunday, dying, being captured by Satan because nobody is teaching them how to pray. And then the people are deceived into thinking that there's no reason to pray. I've heard multitudes of people complaining. I pray, but I get no answers. I prayed so long, so hard, without any results. All I want to see is a little evidence of God changing things. Things go on as usual. Nothing happens. How long must I wait? And these people no longer visit their prayer closet, their secret closet, because they are convinced that their petitions born in prayer are somewhere miscarried at the throne. Others are convinced that only Daniel, David, and Elijah types can get their prayers through to God. But I'm here to say to you, your prayers can get through. God wants to hear your prayers. In all honesty, many saints of God struggle with these thoughts. If God's ear is open to my prayer, and I pray diligently, why is there such little evidence of his answering? Is there one certain prayer you've been praying for such a long time, and as yet it has not been answered? Have many years gone by, and still you wait, hoping, yet wondering? Let us be careful not to charge God, as Job did, with being slothful or lazy and unconcerned about our needs and petitions, because God is not that way. Job complained, I cry unto thee, and thou dost not hear me. I stand up, and thou regardest me not, in Job 30, 20. His vision of God's faithfulness was clouded by his present difficulties, and he ended up accusing God of forgetting him. But God rebuked Job soundly for it. And God revealed himself to God. And in the end of Job, we see Job praising God. We see Job repenting. Job's situation was so bad that Job's wife told him, you need to curse God and die. His best friends gave up on him. And Job was discouraged and frustrated. And he began to blame God for his circumstances. But Job hung in there and he stuck with God and he prayed. And at one point, Job said, I know that my Redeemer lives, and I shall see him in the latter day. Ladies and gentlemen, you've got to be like Job. No matter how difficult your situation is today, no matter how tough your circumstances are today, you've got to be like Job and call on the name of the Lord. You've got to stick with Jesus. So reason number one of our three three. Uh, points today in part one of why God does not hear our prayers. Reason number one, our prayers are aborted when they are not according to God's will. Number one, you need to write this down, when they are not according to God's will. We've got a lot of people praying, 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 but you're praying out of God's will. You're praying amiss, the Bible says. There, God, there's a way to pray. Um, we find that God will teach us how to pray. Jesus taught his disciples how to pray. But a lot of us are praying, and we're praying off the point. We're praying at, amiss. We're not praying correctly. We're not at liberty to pray at random for whatever our selfish minds conceive. We're not permitted to come into his presence and vent our silly notions and mindless ramblings. If God signed all of our petitions and answered our prayers without direction, he would end up giving his glory away. Some of the things we ask God for and some of the th 
ladies and gentlemen, some of the prayer requests I get from people are just silly, just plain atrocious, just plain ridiculous, so totally outside of the will of God, <clears throat> so totally adverse to the scriptures. There is a law of prayer. It is a law meant to weed out beggarly, self-centered prayers, while at the same time making it possible for honest seekers to ask in confidence. In other words, we can pray for whatsoever we will as long as it's in his will. So number one, make sure that what you're asking God for is according to his will. You may say, well, how will I know what his will is? That is where Bible study comes in. That is why we teach the word of God here at Back to Basics Ministries. We want you to know the word of God because when you know the word of God, you know God's will for your life. John, 1 John 5, 14 says, if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. Ladies and gentlemen, if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. The Bible declares that he hears us when we ask according to his will. The disciples were not praying according to God's will when they prayed with vindictiveness and revenge in their hearts. They had bitterness in their hearts. At one point, they asked Jesus, shall we command fire to come down from heaven and consume these people? Ladies and gentlemen, that is not a prayer. That is not a prayer. That is not a prayer. God does not want us to hate people, to be vindictive. Jesus said, you do not know what manner of spirit you are of. That's in Luke chapter 9, 54 and 55. Jesus told them that spirit in you is not of me. It's not of God. You want to call down fire. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I must confess. I must confess. And I'm so glad my son, Wes, is on with us today up in Chester, up up in uh, New Jersey. And Wes can remember uh, when his daddy got kicked out of his first church. Yes, they kicked me out of my first church when I came out of seminary years ago. They kicked me out. They kicked my family and me out of the parsonage. They kicked us to the curb. Why? Because they said, you're preaching that we're sinners. And you're, you're telling us we're sinners. And why don't you preach and tell us we're nice and, and preach some loving sermons and hold our hand and tell us how much you love us and how much God loves us. Well, ladies and gentlemen, God told me to tell them, you need to stop that shacking up. You need to stop you, you're whoring around. You, and these were, look, these were deacons and trustees in the Baptist church, ladies and gentlemen, shacking up, living with other men's wives and, and, and living with women. They weren't married, leading the church. And I had to preach against it. And so they told me, they said, if you don't stop, we're going to bounce you out. Sure enough, they didn't lie. They kicked me and my family out of the church, told us to leave the parsonage. Get out of the, get out of the park. You know, Christians can be some mean, look back up. So-called Christians can be some mean folks. And we got some mean folks who are Christians. If you've got bitterness in your heart, if you've got lust in your heart, if you're living in sin, and you're trying to hide your sin, you can't hide. But you know, here's what Christians do. They stone the prophets. They throw rocks at the mailman. They don't want you preaching the uh, against sin. They don't want you calling them sinners. They want you to come and speak something nice to him because pastor, we pay your salary and, and we give you a bonus on pastor's aid Sunday. Ladies and gentlemen, they kicked me out of my church, kicked me and my children and wife and children out in the street. I said, well, where are we going to go? They said, we don't care. You can go to hell if you want to. That's what they told me, ladies and gentlemen. They told their pastor, we don't care where you go. You can go to hell if you want to. Lord Jesus, we're talking about Christians, ladies and gentlemen, in a Baptist church here in the good old USA, in America. Ladies and gentlemen, they kicked me to the curb. And here I am, broke, busted, and disgusted. And my point is, 
my son Wes. Wes was in the fifth grade at that time. And Wesley said, hey, Dad, let's go visit the chairman of the deacon board and let's kick his behind. <laughs> Woo, Wesley, uh, Wesley, not Wesley. I love that. I love my son. I love my son. I love my son. He was trying to protect our family integrity and our dignity. He was hurt. His sisters were hurt. My wife was hurt. I was hurt. And Wes said, Dad, let's go. Because I know, he said, I know the chairman of the deacon board was a perpetrator and got us in this mess. He said, let's go kick his behind. And I said, no, Wes, we can't do that. God will not honor us. Even though, ladies and gentlemen, hey, Andy Mack, I wanted to go. I wanted to. I wanted to go with West. I wanted to do a number on him, but I couldn't do it. I, West, I couldn't do it. I see you laughing in the chat window. I couldn't do it, West. Although, hey, I wanted to do it. I was like those disciples. The disciples said, "Let us call fire down on these turkeys. Burn these suckers up, ladies and gentlemen. We've had people in our lives. We wanted to call fire down on them. We wanted to burn them up." Ladies and gentlemen, we've been hurt by people. We've been deceived by people. And yes, Christians do get hurt. And Christians do want to call fire down on people, ladies and gentlemen. But we couldn't do that. We couldn't do that. We couldn't. Do I couldn't let my son, Wes, uh, go with me and, and, and we whoop up on the deacons. Because I know if we had whooped up on one of them, we'd have got all of those turkeys. But no, we had to say, we forgive them. And well, let's move on. Let's, it was painful, ladies and gentlemen. It is painful. <clears throat> it's painful to forgive people who hurt you. But that's the way Jesus did on the cross. He said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing, Wes might say right now. But, Dad, they knew what they were doing. <laughs> Wes might say, but, Dad, they knew. When they did it to you, they knew exactly what they were doing. Yes, yes, yes. But praise God, hallelujah. We learned a lot from that. We learned how to love people through our own hurt, just like Jesus, through his own hurt. The greatest love in all history was shown by Jesus Christ, who forgave the ones who hurt him the most. And so, number one, God will not hear your prayers when you do not pray according to his will. We can't be like the disciples calling fire down on your neighbor. Your neighbor's running crap games and having parties and drug parties and orgies and all this, or the church uh, acting ugly and, and people acting ugly and, and stuff going on throughout the nation. You can't fire, call firepower on them. You've got to love them. You've got to pray to God to deliver them. And you've got to do according to the word of God. We've got to stay in God's holy will. No matter what they do to us, we've got to walk the walk, not just talk the talk. Reason number two why our prayers are not answered. Okay, uh, let me just go back to reason number one and, and say that we know too much about what we want and too little about what God wants. So make sure that what you're asking God is according to his will. Reason number two, our prayers, God does not hear our prayers because our prayers are often designed to fulfill an inner lust or a dream or an illusion. Let me repeat that. Point number two, why God does not hear our prayers is because our prayers are often designed to fulfill an inner lust a dream or an illusion. James 4, 3 says, you ask and receive not because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your lust. A lot of our prayers, a lot of our petitions unto God are based on our own lust. I get people, pray to God to bless me financially. Pray to God to bless us with a house. Pray to God to bless me with a third job. Look, you got two jobs. You're neglecting your wife. You're neglecting your children. You got two jobs. Now you want a third job. Yes, but I want to make ends meet. No, the ends will never meet. 
You need to take your time out and minister to your family. You got three, two jobs. You don't go to church. You don't worship God. You don't spend time worshiping God. You think God's going to give you a third job? Satan's out to destroy you. You workaholic. He's out to destroy you. You're lusting for money. You're lusting for stuff. I get a lot of prayer requests. People praying for stuff. Ladies and gentlemen, pray for a close relationship with God. Pray that you get out of that adulterous relationship. Pray that you get out of that homosexual relationship. Pray that you be delivered from lesbianism. Pray that you be delivered from evil spirits. Pray that you be delivered from witchcraft. Pray that you get into the perfect will of God. Walk in holiness. Pray that God's will be done, not your will be done. God will not answer any prayer that will honor, will add to our honor or assist our temptations. God's not going to answer your prayers if you're praying, God, help me have a good night uh, with my neighbor's wife. Help me hit and score and, and not get caught. Ladies and gentlemen, that prayer is praying amiss, but there are people who pray this. God, help me hit the number. God, uh, give me a dream. Give me a lottery number. Help me hit the number. Help me score big. God, uh, and ladies and gentlemen, that's praying amiss. Lord, help me when I go to the uh, uh, casino. And ladies and gentlemen, there are Christians busting the casino wide open. One of the reasons why they kicked me out of my church, my first church, is because they knew I never went there on Saturday. Saturday was my day off. I stayed home. But one Saturday, one Saturday, ladies and gentlemen, I heard the Lord say, go down to the church. Drive down to the church. I said, God, but I don't go down to the church. Go down to the church. Ladies and gentlemen, I went down to the church. Every officer in the church and their girlfriends and, and, and wives and friends were sitting on a chartered bus. There was a chartered bus in front of the church. And every officer in that church was on that bus heading to a casino, getting ready to go to a casino. Ladies and gentlemen, I walked in the bus. They said, uh-oh, there's Pastor. I said, hello, good morning, everybody. Where are y'all going? Nobody said anything, but I knew they were going to the casino. And when I peeped their car, when I overturned their their casino table, I knew it was the end, the beginning of the end. A couple months later, I was out in the street with my wife and children, looking for a place to play, to stay, a place not to play, a place to stay. Praise God, praise God. So number two, uh, if you're praying. For something that's to feed your own lust or your own dreams or your own illusions, God will not hear your prayers. Psalm 66, 18 says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, he will not even hear me. Now, ladies and gentlemen, it's as plain as that. Psalm 66, 18. You need to write this down. The Bible says, if I regard iniquity in my heart. He will not even hear me. Ladies and gentlemen, now you know, you know when there's sin in your heart. You don't need somebody to tell you. You, need, you don't need some prophet to come and tell you. You know when your heart ain't right. The scripture says, if I know there's sin in my heart, God won't even hear me. So why does not, why does God not hear my prayers or your prayers? If I know I got sin in my heart, I can pray all night long. I can fast and pray. I can pray to the moon turns blue. God's not going to hear me because God is not going to violate his word. He said in his word, Psalm 66, 18, if I know there's sin in my heart, he's not going to hear me. I can sound all religious. I can st stand up like one of those deacons in the church or a uh, pastor in the pulpit or even the prayer bed, I can lay on the floor, prostrate on the floor. I can pray in tongues all night long. But if I know there's sin in my heart, if I know that after I'm going to pray, I'm going to get up 
and I'm going to go and meet with Mrs. Jones because we got a thing going on. It ain't going to work, ladies and gentlemen. And you can pray all night in prayer service. And you know, if you're going to get up and you're going to go sleep with somebody else's husband, God is not going to hear your prayer. You're wasting your time. You've been deceived. You need to get up and do right. You need to get up and do right. Joshua prayed all night long. He laid on his face. He cried unto God. He prayed all night long, praying for Israel. Israel had just uh, recently won a great victory at Jericho. The walls of Jericho came down. And then they went to a place called Ai, which was a strong fortified city. And God sent them against Ai. And the Israelites fled. The Aians whooped up on the Israelites and defeated Israel. Sometimes your, your worst defeats come after a great victory if you turn your back against God and disobey God. And Joshua could not understand how God would let his people be defeated after such a great victory at Jericho. And Joshua laid on his face all night long. He cried. He groaned and travailed and cried unto the Lord on behalf of Israel. And God spoke to him and said, get up. Stop your crying. Stop your complaining. There's sin in the camp. Sanctify the people. And so Joshua got the message from God. He got up. He stopped the prayer. He stopped the crying. He would no longer cry out for Israel because God said somebody in the camp has sinned. And Ai had stolen an idol. And God just helped Joshua to discover he had all the tribes march before him. And the Holy Spirit pointed out the one who had sinned. God knows who's sinning. God knows what's happening in your household. And, and the Bible says, if I know there's iniquity in my heart, he won't even hear me. So you need to confess your own sins. And if you know somebody in your house is sinning, you need to deal with that. I know many, many people, especially single women who have kids and their kids are dealing drugs. They're dealing drugs and their kids are paying the mortgage, paying the rent based on their drug sales. But when you're selling drugs, you drug dealer, you are killing some mama's daughter, some mama's son. When you're dealing drugs, you're killing people. You're a murderer. You are a low down, no count murderer, you drug dealer. Yes, I'm going to tell it like it is. God does not want you destroying people. He does not want you making your money, your livelihood, destroying the, li the lives of others. He did not put you in this life to destroy people. He put you in this life to love his creation. All mankind is made in God's image. So he'll deal with the drug dealer. I don't know how I got way out there, but I got way out there. Amen. Amen. Uh, I hear you people. People, women, sons, uh, uh, praying for their sons and daughters, praying uh, for the deliverance of their sons and daughters. But, you know, they don't pray while their sons and daughters are paying that mortgage. They don't pray while their sons and daughters are making that money. They know their sons and daughters are making unclean money, but that's putting food on the table, paying the rent. Ladies and gentlemen, the Bible says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, he will not even hear me. If you know that you know that you know that something's not right in your house and you don't repent and confess it to God, God will not hear you. Not only do you have to confess it to God and pray about it, you have got to do something about it. I remember years ago, a woman called me when I lived in Chester, Pennsylvania. She called me. And she said her son was 45 years old and he lived with her and he was beating her and abusing her and misusing her and selling drugs. What should she do? She called me. So here's what I told her. I said, you need to put that turkey out of your house, pack up his clothes, put them on the stoop of your door and tell him, no, you can't come in here anymore. You're not to whip me. You're not to beat on me or dishonor me. And you need to stop selling drugs. 
ladies and gentlemen, you know what she said to me? She said, you're hard, Pastor God. You're too hard. You're too hard. That's my son you're talking about. Ladies and gentlemen, yes, we have to love stupid people also. We've got to love stupid people also. We've got to minister to them. we got to love them uh, and, and minister to, to them in the name of Jesus. Amen. We've got to uh, minister to the imbeciles, the nitwits, uh, uh, those who don't have any, any mind. Uh, we've got to love them because God made them in their image, but we don't have to put up with what they're putting out. Well, let's move into our third uh, and final reason why God does not hear our prayers. And that's final for today. We'll continue next week with the final three in a set of six. Number three, our prayers can be denied when we show no diligence to assist God in the answer. If we don't show any effort to assist God, in the answer to our prayers, God's not going to hear us. You can pray all night long for God to deliver you from adultery. You can pray all night, night long. But if you don't assist God in that, if you don't stop sleeping with your neighbor's wife, you're just wasting your time. You're making a mockery of God and you're on your way to hell unless you repent. You can pray all night long. You can cry all night long. You can groan and travail. You can fast and pray for 30 days. You can do the Daniel fast. But if you're a homosexual and you're going to keep on sleeping with men, you're just praying. You're just making noise. You need to stop it. You need to stop it. You need to say, no, I was not made for this. God will forgive you if you repent of your sins. But repent means to turn from it. Don't do it anymore. You can pray that God help you stop being a shoplifter, but then you go back into a Walmart or 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 a Kmart or or Family Dollar or Macy's, and you you still uh, steal. Ladies and gentlemen, you can pray. You can ask for prayer warriors. You can call the prayer mountain, but unless you assist God, what do you mean assist God? Assist God means you apply the word of God and you cease doing what you know you're not supposed to be doing. Because the Bible teaches us, if I regard iniquity in my heart, God will not even hear me. Second Thessalonians 3.10 says, We command you that if any would not work, neither should he eat. Ladies and gentlemen, I've met many people. Pray, Pastor, can you pray uh, for some food for us? And we used to give out food boxes in our church in Chester, Pennsylvania. And uh, when you give out food boxes, uh, you see a whole lot of people coming for the food boxes. Okay. And so uh, you find that many of the unemployed come and get the food boxes. Then you get a lot of the lazy. Okay. You have the needy and you have the greedy. We met all kinds of people, but the, the Bible teaches us that if a man won't work, he should not eat. Second Thessalonians 3.10. Now, that does not condemn people who cannot work. If you're disabled, you're sick, you cannot work, that does not include you. But we're talking about those able-bodied suckers out there, those able-bodied manipulators. They don't want to work. And there are many women in the body of Christ, in the church. You got a man at home. He ain't working. He ain't going to work. You let him in your house. He ain't going to work. You know the sucker was lazy when you let him in, but you said he's pretty. He got that nice look, that nice smile. And, and you're going out there working two jobs and feeding his habits. Ladies and gentlemen, he, he ought to be out in the street. If a man won't work, he should not eat. We're talking about a man who's able-bodied and can find work. I know there are some jobs uh, out there, and there are lack of jobs in areas. But even if you're unemployed, you can find something to do. You can clean your neighbor's yard. You can volunteer. That's work, and God will feed you. But if a man will not work, a man should not eat.
God has every right to rouse us and tell us to get up off our knees and say, why sit around lazily waiting for a miracle? Have I not commanded you to flee from the very appearance of sin? You are to do more than simply pray against your lust, but you are commanded also to run from it. You cannot rest until you have done all that is commanded. That's what God is saying to us. The Bible says, flee youthful lust. If you know you have a weakness for women, you have a weakness for gambling, you have a weakness for sex, you have a weakness for drugs, you have a weakness for stealing, you have a weakness for lying, you have a weakness for gossip, you're on your cell phone all the time talking about somebody, you're on Facebook all the time talking about somebody, you need to repent and get up off it. You need to come off Facebook for a while. You need to come off Twitter. If everything coming out of your mouth is vicious and vindictive and ungodly, you need to shut it down. Don't ask God for a miracle. God, help me to stop gossiping. Well, shut your mouth. That's the best way to stop gossiping. Lock your fingers. Shut your cell phone down. Don't just pray, God, help me to stop gossiping. And I know some of you say, well, hey, <laughs> It's just a little sin. A little sin ain't going to hurt nobody. It was a little sin. It was a little sin that Eve listened to the serpent. And then the more she listened to that little sin, it became a big sin. And she ate of the forbidden fruit. And she gave it to her husband. It was a little sin that Adam watched his wife every day listen to the serpent. He should have shut it down. He should have shut it down. He should have stepped on that serpent's head and smashed him to bits. Oh, you preach violence. No, I don't preach violence. I preach reality. I preach obedience to the word of God. If there's something going on and I know it ain't right, I have responsibility to shut it down. If I regard iniquity in my heart, God won't hear me. I've got to repent of my sin. I've got to confess it. Then I got to get away from it. I've had to flee many things. I've got to get away from it. Satan still tempts me. Satan will always tempt me, but I don't have to yield to temptation. And you don't have to yield also. Call upon the name of the Lord. Pray, 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 pray. But then mix your prayers with some action. Turn from iniquity. I give, I've given you three reasons why God does not hear our prayers. Number one, God won't hear our prayers if we pray according uh, to our own will and not his will. Number two, God will not hear our prayers if our prayers are based on our own inner lust or dreams or illusions or deceptions. Number three, God will not hear our prayers if we show no diligence to assist him and do what he says do. So many people are sitting around waiting on a miracle when God has already commanded you what to do. So let's mix our faith with some works. Let's just not talk the talk. Let's walk the walk. Pray, but do what God says do. This is Pastor Leroy Carter. I, I, as I said earlier at the top of the service, this series of messages is going to change your life going to change your life. It's changing mine. God wants to hear your prayers. God wants to be your friend. He made you and me to fellowship with him and commune with him. And let's add this. God will not hear your prayers if you're not saved unless you're praying for salvation. God is not going to answer your prayers, ladies and gentlemen, if you're not saved unless you're praying for salvation. You must be born again. Jesus said, no man comes unto the Father but by me. So you must have Jesus Christ in your life in order to reach the Father. God said, call unto me and I will answer you. I will show you great and mighty things which thou knowest not. But Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. So let's start by all of you who are not saved. 
you can be saved today. If you're not saved, you can ask the Lord Jesus Christ to come into your life and give you the gift of salvation. That means you're going to surrender your life to him and you're going to walk with him for the rest of your days. You're going to learn the scriptures. You're going to learn how to pray. You're going to learn how to fellowship with God. You're going to find a church where you can uh, worship God and, and, and you're going to commit your life to God for the rest of your life. Well, bless God. I pray that this message has helped you. If you have any questions, uh, send me an email, LeroyCarter69 at Yahoo.com, or give me a call, 404-205-1101. Notice, we have not asked for your money. Give your money to the local church. Give your money to wherever God tells you to tithe. If God speaks to you about seeding to this ministry, obey the Lord. But we don't ask. We don't put a bag on you. We're, we're to give you the word of God. Freely we have received, freely we give. We have needs, but our greatest need is that you walk with the Lord. God bless you. We're going to sign off uh, first with our Facebook family. Facebook family, it's been a joy and a pleasure uh, being with you today. And we'll see you uh, next time. Praise God. And now we're going to sign off from our Back to Basics family. Back to Basics family, we're going to stop the recording. But you feel welcome, feel free to call in with your questions or comments.